Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله هيا على الصلاة هيا على الصلاة I hope that it's okay for me to keep my mask off, but if not, I can put it on. In Alhamdulillah, in Ahmaduhu, and Astainuhu, and Astaghfiruhu, and Nauzu Billahi, and Shuri and Fushina, and in Sayya Ate Amalina, and Yadi Hilla, who fell out of the law, and you live who fell out of the Allah. When I should do Allah, Ilaha, Ilallah, who are the Hula Sharikala, when I should do Anna Muhammad and Abduhu were a Suluhu. بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا So inshallah we'll talk about some aspects of fasting today including the medical benefits but I want to preface my khutbah by saying that in Islam, when it comes to worshipping, we do it as a part of what we call ta'abud or amal ta'abudi. That is out of being Allah's abd. That when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to do something or to avoid something, our first response is sama'ina wa atana. We heard it and we obey it. Thereafter, we are at liberty to exercise our intellect and try and figure out why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala order us to do this or not to do this. There are objectives of sharia or maqasidu sharia and then there are asraru sharia or secrets of sharia. That what are the hidden benefits of something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to do or not to do. This then So when it comes to fasting, the very first thing that we do is that whoever witnesses this month should fast. So we fast because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to fast. And we chose the month of Ramadan, Kusharu Ramadan and the Kundira al It is the month that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose to in his last book, Al-Quran, 
to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now, why did he choose this month? It is up to him. I don't know that. Maybe some scholar has mentioned it, but I don't know that. Last week, we had a conference of uh, the medical doctors, the Association of Pakistani Physicians of New England, and I was asked to talk about the spiritual and the spiritual benefits of fasting, as well as to talk about it, its connection with my specialty, which is cancer medicine. So I'll just give you a brief overview of the fasting in relationship with cancer and cancer th uh, therapy, the chemotherapy. There's a term that is being used now instead of just fasting, it's called fasting mimicking diet, FMD, where a person is not necessarily fasting in the entire time, but he focuses more on water and less on calorie consumption and can go on several hours from four to five hours to 12 to 16 hours a day, which is called intermittent fasting and see what kind of benefit it has on overall health. And it is because of the risk of obesity and metabolic syndrome, which is, seems to be affecting 50% of the world's population in the Western countries. But even when we look at the poor countries, we see obesity and it's very hard to define what is poverty now? What are po poor countries? A Pakistan economist, Dr. Mehbubul Haq, who used to be finance minister in Pakistan, brilliant statistician, he came up with a concept of human development index, HDI, which is a composite statistical index of educational status, longevity, and income. And based upon that, he divided the world countries into four tiers the high HDI, the low HDI, and in between. And interestingly, 62% of people, even in the low HDI countries, can be considered to be obese. There's a book that I will recommend all of you to read. It's called Factfulness. It is written by a Swedish doctor as well as a statistician who said there are 10 reasons why our outlook on the world is actually wrong in the light of the statistics that we think that the poor countries are still the way they were 100 years ago or even 30 years ago. The world has changed. The westernization is not limited to Western countries. It's very much a phenomenon in the Eastern countries. What goes on in the developed countries is also happening in the developing and underdeveloped countries. And the diseases that we commonly associated with the Western world such as diabetes, high blood pressure, hyperlipidemia, risk of heart attack, risk of stroke, which is all now com combined in something called metabolic syndrome is also very common in the developing and underdeveloped countries. So coming back to my own specialty, that obesity is linked with a 14 to 20% increase risk of cancer. And it has been found to have an association with at least 13 types of cancers, including colon cancer. So people have been looking at, does diet decrease the risk of cancer? And there is evidence which is emerging. But more interestingly, a study was conducted in 2016 in Saudi Arabia during Ramadan. So what they did was a very small study of about 19 patients that they gave them a fasting diet. Obviously in Ramadan they are fasting, but they gave them a fasting diet. And then they give, gave them chemotherapy and found that those patients who were fasting or were provided with a fasting mimicking diet and then chemotherapy actually did better in terms of side effects from chemotherapy. And this is a phenomenon which led to a Japanese scientist winning Nobel Prize for medicine in 2016, it's called autophagy. That when you are starving, when you are fasting, I won't use the word starving, they use the word starvation in medical literature, but let's look at fasting or fasting mimicking diet. The, obviously the body cells are affected and the cells use their waste products to recycle and survive. And in this way, the normal body cells have an advantage over cancer cells. So the cancer cells die it's called autophagy, they swallow themselves, they self-destroy themselves, while the normal cells are able to survive. This study was then reproduced in the Western world with higher number of patients, and the results were shown that yes, if you give a patient some fasting mimicking diet, water, vegetables, 
less calories, less fat, and then they, you give them chemotherapy 24 hours to 140 hours later, they tend to tolerate chemotherapy better. So that's kind of an interesting thing that what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done for us, whatever command he has given to us, is for our own benefit. It has taken 1400 years for medical science to find out certain benefits in fasting and praying and going to Hajj and all that. The economic benefit of giving zakat, the circulation of wealth. But the first, our first response is we believe in Allah and we obey Him. So that was the, the medical aspect of fasting, but I want to come to the spiritual aspect of fasting. And obviously there are many, but I want to focus on one thing, which is the renewal of Iman. Now we all are Muslims, most majority of us are born Muslims, so it's like being handed over to us. We call ourselves Muslims, we call ourselves believers. We don't even think that Iman can be taken away from us, or that Iman can live us. There's very famous hadith in which the Prophet mentioned that when a Zani commits zina, he's not a believer. When a thief commits theft, he's not a believer. When a person drinks alcohol, he's not a drinker. The Iman lives him. And it only comes back to him when he stops doing this. The second is a hadith narrated by Abdullah bin Amr bin Nasr radiallahu ta'ala anhum. Anhum qala qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that Iman deteriorates or it wears away just like a piece of cloth wears away. So ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep renewing your Iman in your heart. We go about our day doing things that are contrary to the Sharia, contrary to the belief system that we all adhere to, we don't pay much attention to that. We don't realize that at part that, that particular moment, we are not actually believers. Our Iman has left us. And five daily prayers, we keep coming back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We keep returning to the state of Iman. So how can we renew the Iman? And it's not going to be a very comprehensive list, but I will provide you with certain things. So first is that hearts become rusted. And as the hadith of the Prophet mentioned that in the body there is a piece of flesh which is hard. If it is good, the rest of the body is good. If it is bad, the rest of the body goes, goes bad. And we all know that, heart disease. Number one killer in the world. Number two is probably cancer. But the heart can rest in a metaphorical way, in a spiritual way as well. If you see someone in trouble and you, you don't feel it, your heart is dead. If you read the Quran, and tears do not come to your heart, to your eyes, your heart is hardened. In fact, one of the things which is recommended is that from the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, that when you recite the Quran, cry. If you don't cry, make yourself cry. It causes softening of the heart. Engaging in actions which are considered undesirable by Sharia, committing major and minor sins, all are some of the causes of the rusting of the heart. And the repolishing the jilaul qalb, one of the ways is zikrul maut, remembering death and remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not praying or not praying appropriately is also one of the reasons because salah is after iman, salat is the most important thing. The first thing that we will be held accountable for on the day of judgment will be salah. And the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned that if this step is over, it's easy then the rest of the accountability process will be easy as well. So paying attention to the salah, in Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word iqamatu salat, yuqimu salat, muqimu salat. And iqamatu salat is not simply praying, it's praying while offering its due. And one of the things, and there is a hadith about it, is the huzur al-qalb, the presence of the heart. Your heart is in the prayer. And a hadith narrated by Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and the Prophet and told her that, oh Aisha, a person gets only as much reward from his prayer as, as much as his heart is into it. In bad company, there is a narration that uh, one of the Sahabis actually came, was passing by the Masjid al-Nabawi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 
And he found Umar Taala was sitting in the company of some people. And while, as he was passing, Umar Taala called him and said, Najlis bina nujadid imanana. Why don't you sit down with us for a few moments? Let's renew our iman. Coming to the masjid five times a day. So first of all, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he gave us this <coughs> blessing of iman. He made us believers from birth. But we have to realize that the quality of iman can fluctuate. There's a big theological debate, debate about whether the quantity of iman increases and decreases. Al iman yazidu wa yanqusu. There is a chapter in Bukhari as well. The Hanafi said there is the quality of Iman that goes away when we are not focused on Iman or when we are doing things which are not desirable by the Sharia. So Iman is a prerequisite for avoiding the hellfire. The Prophet said that whoever said, La ilaha illallah, none has the right to be worshipped but Allah, and has in his heart Iman equal to the weight of a barley grain will be taken out of hell. And whoever said, no one has the right to be worshipped but Allah, and has in his heart, Iman equal to the weight of a wheat grain will be taken out of hell. And whoever said, none has the right to be worshipped but, but Allah, but has in his heart, Iman equal to the weight of an atom will be taken out of hell. Now how to renew our Iman? And this is one month, an entire month, which is a training ground for us. It's a training period. I'm sure there are quite a few doctors over here. When we are going through our residency training of three years, we rotate through different departments, different specialities, and those rotations are one month. Longer than one month causes boredom. Less than one month is not enough. So one month of fasting, you can say that this is a rotation, a spiritual rotation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed for us once a month. During this rotation, we spend our days fasting with a conscious mind. We spend the nights standing up for prayers. We wake up for tahajjud, we wake up for suhoor, we perform sahari to, to keep the tradition of the Prophet alive. We control our desires, physical as well as sexual desires. We control our anger. If somebody is shouting us, we say, in Nisaim, in Nisaim. This is a month of training. How much do we get out of it? Depends upon what we do when the month is over. And at that time, we have the sixth fast of Shawwal to reinforce that. And then we have three fasts every month, 13th, 14th, and 15th. We have two fasts, Friday and, sorry, Monday and Thursday. We have the fast of Ashura. We have the fast of Yom Arafah. This is a program that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has built for our spiritual training. So developing taqwa, True recognition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is marafatullah. Establishing prayer with khushu and khudu. Proper observation of all its acts. Not rushing through the prayer. Recitation of the Holy Quran and pondering over it. This is the month. You know, one should complete one recitation of the Quran in this month, once a year. Try to memorize some part of the Quran, even if it is one verse. Try to listen to the scholars and the tafasir, whatever you can do. Maybe learn some tajweed from anyone that you can. Take some benefit out of this thing. And I always encourage people that take the last 10 days off. And a few years ago, a brother came to me and said, Salim, have you taken 10 days off in the Ramadan? I said, no. Since that time, I've been trying to take the last 10 days off. But if you can't take the 10 days off, at least take the 27th of Ramadan and 27th of Ramadan off so that the 27th night can be spent that at least we should be able to stay awake the entire night of Laylatul Qadr until the Matla al Fajr. So that we are counted among the angels who are coming down during this night. And the word Arru is oftentimes thought to be Angel Jibril, but according to Imam Razi, Ru could be something even greater than Jibril. We don't know that, only Allah knows. But if you want to enjoy the company of the angels, if you want to earn the reward of more than a thousand months in one particular night, then that is the night. But if you have to worry that you will have to wake up at six o'clock and go to work on that day, you can imagine what you will be doing. So please try to take the last 10 days off, if not at least the 26th and 27th days so that the 27th night can be spent in prayer and the Eid day, obviously. 
constant remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which cleanses the rust over our hearts. Visiting the graves, the Prophet ﷺ encouraged, he said, I used to prohibit you to avoid any shirk, but now I allow you to go and visit the graves. Acquiring the required religious knowledge, Iman is a discipline, it has to be learned. The Hajjud prayer, keeping the company of the people of Iman, remembering the day of judgment, Tua, and adherence to little acts of Sunnah. First will be in this month, Tasaharu. The Prophet ﷺ encouraged us to wake up for Sahri. But the word that he used, according to Arabic grammar, Tasahur is from the Bab Tafa'ul, which means make an effort make it a habit to wake up for suhoor. But there are people who say we don't need it. You know, we keep awake till two o'clock. Why do we have to wake up two hours later? We have plenty of food. We don't need it. Well, it's to keep the sunnah alive. The Prophet ﷺ wanted us to do suhoor, even if it is just with al-aswad and the two black ones, the water and the date, even if this is all you want to eat. You can eat anything else you want to. The other thing is that at your dining table, Make a zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Make some dua. Say a salutation on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And a couple of things that you can still do. One is honey. Honey is mentioned in the Quran. It is for shifa. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam loved it. Have a bottle of honey on the dining table. Make just one little finger. If, if, even if you are a diabetic. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also loved vinegar. Keep a little bottle of vinegar. Apply it to your salon roti, whatever you have, rice, anything. These are little acts of sunnah, but what is the reward of following the sunnah? If you tell Prophet Sallallahu to them that if you really claim to love Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, then follow me. The reward of following the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah will love you, He will forgive your sins. What can be the greater time than this month of Ramadan to act upon the faraid as well as to act upon the sunnah of the Prophet Every action is multiplied by at least 10 times, up to 700 times, especially in Ramadan. And بغير حساب إنما يوفى الصابرون أجرهم بغير حساب People who are patient are given their reward بغير حساب couple of explanations of it. One is, you cannot even count it. It's more than 700, up to as much as Allah wants. The other Baghair Hisab is that on the Day of Judgment, there will be no accountability. Allah will simply look at you and say, enter the Jannah, inshallah. Aqooli qaali hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa la dhikrullah akbar. الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا ايها الذين امنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما صليت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما باركت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد دي مسلم كوميونتي مسلم سنتر فور سوشيال سيرفيسز مسلم كوميونتي سوشيال سيرفيسز ام سي اس اس از هولدنج اتس ورچوئل فند ريزر ذس ايوننگ ات 5:30 پي ام the online address is mcssnewengland.org and Dr. Ikram is outside here. If you're not able to attend, if you're not able to send them a check, you can give him a check as well. And do consider setting up an endowment trust. MCSS has an endowment trust. This is money that is being invested. Your money will stay, the principal will stay there. The returns on the investment will be used for charitable purposes. So it's like Sadaqa Jariya. The second is a sad announcement that uh, Sister Zaida Beg, mother of Shoaib Siddiqui and mother-in-law of Rosina Siddiq, Siddiqui has passed away in Pakistan. We make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna lillahi wa inna ilihi raji'un. Allahum akhfir laha warhamha wa adkhila fi jannatil firdaus. Allahum aiza min azab al-qabr wa min azab al-nar. اللهم اغسل بالماء والثلج والبرد اللهم نقها من الخطايا كما ينقى الصوب الابيض من الدنس الله سبحانه وتعالى we plead to you in the name of your mercy in the name of the prophet صلى الله عليه واله وسلم you are rabbul alamin and your prophet is rahmatul lil alamin الله سبحانه وتعالى forgive our sister she was a muslima 
she died in the holy month of Ramadan, write down all hasanat for her, forgive her sins, wipe away her sins, protect her from the azab, azab of qabr, protect her from the azab of nar, wa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make her accountability easy, make her enter into Jannah bi'ghair hisab, and give her a place in the highest level of Jannah, Jannatul Firdaus, in the company of Anbiya and Siddiqeen and Shohada and Swalihin. Ameen Ya Rabbil Alameen. Inna Allah ya'muru billah dhil wa lihsani wa ita'i dhil qurba wa yanha anil fahshai wal munkar wal bag ya'izukum la'allakum tazakkarun wa aqimu salah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah, Ashadu an Muhammad Rasulullah. Ayyam al-salati ni'ala al-fanah, qad qamati al-salati, qad qamati al-salati. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illa Allah.